there is a vortex of epic proportions happening outside, so if you hear wind, I'm sorry that I live on Earth. What's up guys, it's V Renee, welcome to my channel, or welcome back to my channel. Um, today, we are starting our month of John Green novels, and we are kicking it off with his latest uh, entry into novel writing, Turtles All the Way Down, I don't think I've ever read such a successful book about nothing before. I went to look up the back of the book to give you guys a synopsis, um, and at least in America, the back of the book for Turtles All the Way Down is just reviews of his book before this, The Fault in Our Stars, which I'm pretty sure came out like almost 10 years ago. I was in high school when it came out. Um, so that should tell you how nothing it really is. Um, however, I did find a synopsis somewhere on the interwebs, and I will read it to you. 16-year-old Aza, Aza, her name is A-Z-A, -A, although you don't find that out until like 30 pages in because her best friend calls her Holmesy because her last name is Holmes. Her name is Aza Holmes. Aja Holmes. Holmesy is a horrible nickname. Let's not even get into it. 16-year-old Aza never intended to pursue the mystery of fugitive billionaire Russell Pickett, but there's a $100,000 reward at stake and her best and most fearless friend, all capitalized, Daisy, is eager to investigate. So together they navigate the short distance and broad divides that separate them from Russell Pickett's son, Davis. Aza is trying. She is trying to be a good daughter, a good friend, a good student, and maybe even a good detective, while also living within the ever-tightening spiral of her own thoughts. In his long-awaited return, John Green, the acclaimed award-winning author of Looking for Alaska and The Fault in Our Stars, both of which I'm covering this month, shares Aza's story with shattering unflinching clarity in this brilliant novel of love, resilience, and the power of lifelong friendship. When and where? Because I got the wrong version of this book because nothing fucking happens. I will tell you what happened. Um, actually, triggering um, triggering descriptions of anxiety and a obsessive compulsive disorder that I had no idea were going to happen. There's no mention of it in that synopsis or the back of the book or anything. So good thing I don't suffer with anxiety. Wait, I fucking do um it was really tough to first of all like Aza at all which is fine you can have an unlikable protagonist um but also just to just to at all feel for Aza because she's constantly stuck in um just her own anxiety and agony and I was like if I relate to her it's gonna trigger me and it's gonna make me anxious because I get where she's coming from. Like this girl has such mental issues. She ends up drinking hand sanitizer because she makes out with the millionaire's son, Davis Pickett, and um, is like, oh my God, his micro microbes are in my body now. I have to swallow hand sanitizer to get them out. So like she's really not well, and that's fine. Um, maybe a trigger warning, maybe mention that in the synopsis anywhere whatsoever at all. Maybe put it on the book somewhere that she's mentally unwell. You told us that The Fault in Our Stars is about kids with cancer. So if I had a child with cancer, if I had cancer, I could choose not to read it. Um, but I, I couldn't choose not to read Turtles all the way down because nowhere did it say that she was suffering with the mental issues that she has very, very intensely. So that's, first of all, that's a gripe that I have. Second of all, nothing fucking happens in this book. Like, nothing at all. So here's what, here's the thing. Aza is, Aza is, um, dealing with her anxieties and everything. And, I, and you know, we don't find out her fucking name for a while because her friends call her Holmesy. Again, terrible nickname. Um, basically, we find out that this billionaire dude has gone missing. Oh, shit. Oh, hey. Daisy, my best friend, she, she reminds me, Aza, Aza, that I knew his son. We went to camp together. Oh shit, so why don't we go talk to the son that I haven't seen in years um, and find out what happened to his dad. So they go under false pretenses to get the reward to the picket estate to talk to Davis. And I'm like, y'all would not be let within like a 200 foot radius of this place if there was an actual investigation going on by the FBI because this man was under investigation for fraud or some shit and he went missing. Y'all would not be allowed to, like, tampering evidence, like, nothing, no, no kids are still living there, like, nobody's worried about, like, any evidence getting fucked up, everyone's still living there. Okay, so... Davis has a younger brother, Noah, and he's taking care of Noah, and then he's, like, falling for Aza despite, like, <laughs> her just really being like a, a total blank slate wet blanket person she's not interesting except for her mental um issues she has no personality outside of 
having anxiety or OCD and missing her father um, who's dead. So like, and she likes to look at the stars with Davis who's like really into stars. Um, so she does that, she's just there all the time unless she's having like a psychotic episode. And I don't mean to like, that's not me being dramatic. I really was like, I have horrible anxiety, like horrible generalized anxiety disorder, depression, PTSD. I have never been in this headspace that Aza is in and I feel bad for her, but she's not a real person. And again, if I knew that's who she was and that was her whole character was being mentally ill, I wouldn't have read this book, first of all. Second of all, nothing happens. So whatever, there, and she's like, oh, there's a camera on the, in the tra on the trail. Me and Daisy are gonna go find the picture and see, okay, great, we saw his foot nothing happens with that eventually davis is like i like you but i can't tell if you like me for me or if you like me because you want to find out what happened to my dad and get the money so here i'm going to give you a hundred thousand dollars he just like pit pulls it out of a cereal box and is like here split it with daisy that way i'll know if you ever talk to me again that it's it's because you like me so she takes the money and but she still like, can't let go of it because she feels really bad for noah the little brother who's like really hurting because his dad is fucking missing and he won't like call them or anything so Noah's like, here's some notes from my dad's phone. Okay, and Aza takes it and one note that she can't figure out is the jogger's mouth. And she's like, what the hell is the jogger's mouth? And Daisy's like, forget about it, we have the money now. She's very poor and works at Chuck E. Cheese and doesn't have a car. And she's like, okay, we're rich now. And the <laughs> culmination of this story is literally that <laughs> Daisy, Aza's, Aza's best friend, writes Star Wars fan fiction and is very popular, uh, her, a very popular writer, I guess on Wattpad. I couldn't tell where exactly she was writing this, but got a lot of like, maybe it's AO3, maybe it's Wattpad, I don't know. But really famous, really popular, and Oz has never read any of them because the whole like point that Daisy has is that Oz is a very selfish person. She's so stuck in her own brain that she doesn't know anything about Daisy and doesn't care. Um, so Aza reads some of the fan fiction, Star Wars fan fiction, which John Green, how much money did you have to pay to use the Star Wars terminology in this book? It wasn't worth it. Like, not important. Um, there's a character in the in the fan fiction named Ayala, which is just Aza, and she sucks. And Aza's like, cool, my best friend fucking hates me. And then Daisy, they're driving somewhere, and Daisy's like, yeah, you're really hard to be around. You're like mustard. A little bit is fine, but a lot of it's too much and then they're arguing they get in a car accident and Aza lacerates her liver and she has to go into the hospital this all happens in like 10 pages she goes in the hospital and they're like you have to stay here and she's very very afraid of getting this disease called c diff um which you can get like in the hospital or whatever like she's very afraid of getting sick and so she like freaks out because she's in the hospital where you can get c diff and she like feels it so anyway then she drinks some hand sanitizer on the wall her mom catches her and they have like a I guess it goes from being in the hospital for her liver to being on like a, a, a <laughs> uh, an even seven like a like a psych psychiatric lockdown I don't fucking know so then she gets on some different meds and they lock her down and make her take the meds and she feels better and she goes back to school and she's like everyone knows that I went crazy and it's like no but we never like address that anyone looks at her differently or anything like there's no there's no repercussions to this except that Daisy's like I didn't mean it when I said you were a bad friend I'm like but you should have she she is a bad friend so like I, nothing ever happens to Aza like nothing there's no repercussions for Aza's behavior from start to finish there's no arc except that maybe she learns not to be such a selfish asshole but she wasn't a selfish asshole she was mentally ill and not on the right meds like what was the point of this fucking book anyway so then when she's better their friend michael who daisy was dating and now she isn't dating i don't fucking care was like oh i'm having an we're having an underground art show and my art isn't it and they're like okay cool let's go to this underground art show in the sewer so they go to the sewer and daisy and Oz like walk around and they're they walk to this like cool place and they realize that this is called like pogues run or something and they realize it's like the mouth of the run They're like oh my god the mouth of the run the jogger's mouth and they smell a really bad smell down there and so she goes and tells davis um hey i think i found your dad's fucking body um here so sorry um but before that they break up because um Aza's like I, I can't have you sitting by me like i can't kiss you like you gross me out <laughs> because she's mentally ill um and poor davis is like okay like i'm just fucking losing everything in my life it's fine um and then that's how the book ends is with her telling davis that we're pretty sure your dad's body is down there and then davis and noah decide to tell the detectives because the other thing is that they don't 
really want to know where their dad is or find their dad because their dad has left their entire estate, like his billions of dollars, not to his sons, but to a, to a Tara, like a, like a prehistoric lizard thing that lives in their greenhouse. Um, so yeah, they, 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 that's, that's the story. That's the whole book. So you're welcome. So I'm just going to talk about some parts that I highlighted because I, for some backstory actually on why I'm choosing to do to do John Green as my second um, infamous author. I was a huge John Green fan in high school, middle school and high school. Um, Looking for Alaska, I was like obsessed with Looking for Alaska. The Fault in Our Stars, I read on the way to and from a beach trip and sobbed my eyes out in the backseat of my friend Lauren's car. Um, Will Grayson, Will Grayson. I literally, I think I have Looking for Alaska, Paper Towns, Will Grayson, Will Grayson, and um, another John Green book on my shelf right now. Like I, I loved John Green's books. I loved Paper Towns, fucking Paper Towns. Like not like other girls, like Margo and Alaska and fucking and Hazel Grace. And like, I loved those because I internalized a lot of misogyny growing up. And I thought that that was cool to be like a manic pixie dream girl and have like a dude who's pretty much just a stale piece of white bread, just like obsessed with you. And like, you're not there to fix his problems. You're just there to be your quirky self. Like I was obsessed with that shit. And this is the first book I've ever read of his that didn't do that. And it wasn't good. So like, I have a problem. And the problem is, why do people like John Green? Can I ask my 15 year old self? No, she's gone. But like, I need to know, I need to remember why. Was it because I wanted boys to like me the way that they liked Alaska and, and Margo and fucking Catherine and Catherine and Catherine and fucking Hazel? I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand. But I, what I do know is I don't fucking like the way John Green writes anymore because <laughs> I'm not 15. I was beginning to learn that your life is a story told about you, not one that you tell. Of course, you pretend to be the author. You have to. You think, I now choose to go to lunch when that monotone beep rings from on high at 1237. But really, the bell decides. You think you're the painter, but you're the canvas. That's like all the time. Like every 10 pages, it's just like, bah, 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 bah. and you know what really bothers me about this is um, if you don't know, John Green along with his brother Hank are like YouTube pioneers and they actually started VidCon, which is like the convention for YouTubers um, and YouTube fans. And this very much sounds like how he would cap a video on Vlogbrothers. Like this very much just sounds like how he would wrap up a video. It doesn't sound like a character, right? Like a character's thoughts. So that was, I think that's what's really bothering me about a lot of this is there's a lot of tangents that just sound more like YouTube tangents, like for a video than they do like writing. Um, so there's that. Um, so page two, we're introduced to Michael Turner spelled M-Y-C-H-A-L. And I'm just like, hey, we're reading this in a, re in a visual medium. Just spell it normal. It's fine. Aza also, don't know how to pronounce that. Not even gonna try. It's not even a real name. Our lunch table was like a long running play on Broadway. The cast changed over the years, but the roles never did. What was my part in this play? The sidekick, capitalized. I was Daisy's friend, capitalized, or Miss Holmes's daughter. I was somebody's something. That's because you aren't a person. You you have no personality. I was in your head for about 200 pages. Um, don't know who you are, except for anxious. Of course, I'd long known that I was playing host to a massive collection of parasitic organisms, but I didn't much like being reminded of it. By cell count, humans are approximately 50% microbial, meaning that about half of the cells that make you up are not yours at all. So again, as someone with anxiety and someone who has a lot of mental issues, I didn't really need this like big shiny spotlight on the fact that like my body's not my own. I already have a lot of dissociation problems. <laughs> I didn't need this. And again, if I would have fucking known, I wouldn't have fucking read it. But no one, no one tells you. No one tells you. As a rule, I try not to read too many spoilers about these books because I try to, you know, give you an honest opinion off the bat. Um, no one was talking about turtles all the way down <laughs> because nobody fucking read this book, I guess. Um, but nowhere, no, nowhere on the book did it say, hey, this girl's got mental issues. Maybe don't read it if you also have mental issues. I would have just appreciated a heads up is all I'm saying. Oh yeah, the reason that Michael's spelling of his name bothers me is because he says there's a hundred people named Michael that are gonna be in this exhibit. And I'm like, yeah, but they're not fucking spelled M-Y-C-H-A-L. So like, you're fine. Again, this is a visual medium, John Green. Um, I clicked over to the article about C. diff, scrolling to the part about how most C. diff effect infections occur in hospitals. This is page four. I scrolled down farther to a list of symptoms 
none of which I had except for the excessive abdominal noises, although I knew from previous searches that the Cleveland Clinic had reported the case of one person who died of C. diff after presenting at the hospital with only abdominal pain and fever. I reminded myself that I didn't have a fever and myself replied, you don't have a fever yet. This is when I wrote, this kid is insufferable. Absolutely, utterly insufferable. Five pages in and I, I, I do not like this person. And then at the end of all this, going through this constantly with this person and I, I sympathize with them, I do. They are sympathetic, Aza is a sympathetic character. I understand because again, I have mental health issues. I know that we can be insufferable and I know that it's not fun to be around us just as it's not fun to be inside our head. But this is a book, like, your, your character is supposed to go through a journey and grow at the to the end to have an arc. Um, and even at the end of this book, if I can find it, I'll, I'll read it to you. John Green tries to explain the arc of this character to us as her explaining her arc. Like it's, it's so meta and so a YouTube video that could have just been made. Like it's very weird. Holmesy, Daisy said, I looked up at her. We're almost through lunch and you haven't even mentioned my hair. She shook out her hair with soap red they were pink highlights. She dyed her hair. I swam up out of the depths and said, it's bold. I know, right? It says ladies and gentlemen and also people who do not identify as ladies or gentlemen. Daisy Ramirez breaks her promises. Oh, Daisy Ramirez won't break her promises, but she will break your heart. Daisy's self-proclaimed life motto was break hearts, not promises. She kept threatening to get it tattooed on her ankle when she turned 18. I would have made that my Tumblr bio in 2010. Um, yeah. Aza. Aza. I thought her name was Aza Holmesy. Um, that's page seven. It's the first time I actually hear her name. This girl Molly walked up to us smiling and said, uh, Daisy, just FYI, your Kool-Aid dye job is staining your shirt. Daisy looked down at her shoulders and indeed her striped top had turned pink in spots. She flinched for a second, then straightened her spine. Yeah, it's part of the look, Molly. Stained shirts are huge in Paris right now. Again, great comeback in 2008. Sometimes I miss you being a little kid, but then I remember Chuck E. Cheese. They mention this so off the cuff and then like two paragraphs later, we realize it's because Daisy works at Chuck E. Cheese and she's gonna drive Daisy to work. Great. Harold was a 16 year old Toyota Corolla with a pink color called Mystic Teal Mica and an engine that clanked in steady rhythm like the beating of his immaculate metallic heart. Harold had been my dad's car. In fact, dad named him Harold. So, Harold is the most interesting character in this book and we wreck him at the end, so that's cool. Yeah, Daisy's like, wow, there's $100,000 on the line to find Russell Pickett and you knew his kid. For two summers after fifth and sixth grade, Davis and I had gone to SAD camp together, which is what we'd called Camp Sparrow, the place down in Brown County for kids with dead parents. His mom's dead, her mom's, her dad's dead. Uh, Davis and I would also sometimes see each other during the school year because he lived just down the river from me, but on the opposite bank. Daisy's like, oh, you knew, you knew Davis P Pickett. Like, wow, you guys knew each other. Day she's talking about when they were little, Daisy and mom and I got onto the canoe and paddled down to Pirate's Island. We dug with spades at the base of a tree and found a little chest full of chocolate coins wrapped in gold foil. Davis had met us down there with his little brother, Noah. So Daisy's like acting like she doesn't know who Davis is and never met him, but clearly they hung out when they were kids sometimes, at least for Oz's birthday. So I get maybe not remembering him, but he's like the b a son of a billionaire. You fucking remember him, come on. The truth is, we were listening to the radio, Daisy said, heard a news report about your father and then Holmesy here told me she had a crush on you when you were kids. And she, I was like, let's go see him. I bet it's true love. So we arranged for a shipwreck and then you remembered she likes Dr. Pepper and it is true love. It's just like the Tempest, okay? I'm gonna leave you now so you can live happily ever after. And she has this thing that she does because her mom told her one time, if you can pinch yourself. Oh my God, I almost dropped my very expensive new iPad. Holy shit. Her mom was once like, if you can't, uh, if you pinch yourself and you don't feel it, then you're in a dream. So she started to push her thumb into the pad of her middle finger till it bled. And then she would just like do that. And then she would clean it and bandage it. And then like keep checking it for like infection and shit. Like that's one of her things she does, which is why I think she has OCD. Cause that seems very compulsive to me, but I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, and it's never mentioned. It's never mentioned by name what she has. Anyway, so then Dave was like, oh yeah, I remember you doing this. And she's like embarrassed about it. Great. Chapter five, I want to date someone, Daisy said. I'd make a go at little orphan billionaire myself, except he wouldn't stop looking at you. Of course he wouldn't. I cooked dinner that night, a macaroni scramble with canned vegetables, boxed macaroni, and some proper cheddar cheese. And then she's like, I'm going to Applebee's with um, Daisy. All right, cool. Applebee's is a chain of mid-quality restaurants serving American food, in quotes, which essentially means that 
capital everything, capital features, capital cheese. We wasted 18 words, John, to tell me what Applebee's is. I don't, I didn't need it, first of all. Second of all, you just straight up copy pasted that from Wikipedia. I don't need, I don't, I'm so confused, like about his career, just in general. She writes fan fiction about Rey from Star Wars and Chewbacca being in love and in a relationship, which people think is like bestiality and weird and great. Russell Pickett has a tattoo that says Nolite te bastardes carborundurum. Don't let the bastards get you down. Okay, Margaret Atwood, we fucking get it. I'm so irritated. So Davis is just like unloading on Ozzy who already has these horrible mental health issues so they're texting like oh my god he's texting about how lonely he is and i just want somebody to be around and like him and whatever <sighs> she says you're not your money he says then what am i when it what is anyone she says i is the hardest word to define and he says maybe you are what you can't not be and i'm tired of the john greenisms these that's exactly what they are john greenisms she's at the fucking psychiatrist's office i've noticed you use that word a lot crazy and you sound angry when you say it almost like you're calling yourself a name well everyone's crazy these days dr singh adolescent sanity is so 20th century it sounds to me like you're being cruel to yourself after a moment i said how can you be anything to yourself I mean, if you can be something to yourself, then yourself isn't like singular. You're deflecting. I just stared at her. You're right that the self isn't simple, Aza. Maybe it's not even singular. Self is a plu plura plurality, but plurality, plur plurality, but pluralities can also be integrated, right? Not, we're not, I'm not, I'm not paying any attention to this. This is really silly. Oh yeah, and the reason that, that Russell Pickett is gonna leave all his money to, to the Tuatara is because Tua is gonna unlock the key to eternal life. He believes he's gonna be able to identify some factor in the Tuatara blood that makes him age slowly and then he's going to cure death. That's why he leaves everything to Tua. He thinks he's going to be remembered as the man who ended death. And then he's end up, he ends up dead anyway. You know that part of Yeats is the second coming where it's like the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity? Yeah, we read it in AP. I think it's actually worse to lack all conviction because then you just go along, you know? You're just a bubble on the tide of empire. That's a good line. Stole it from Robert Penn Warren. He said, my good lines are always stolen. I lack all conviction. Every mm, 13 pages approximately, we reference a book that someone else wrote that our character is read that makes them feel something about some way, something. And I said this with Tracy Wolf, and I'm not gonna be sexist and not mention it with John Green. Telling me that your character read something and then using another author's words to describe what you should be describing is fucking lazy. It's fucking lazy. It's lazy. Don't tell me that Grace Foster saw a documentary on PTSD and that's how she's feeling right now. Don't tell me every 13 pages that they read a poem in school and that's how they're feeling right now. Stop relating it to other people's words. Make up your own, make up your own. It is so annoying to me. That's, I, I don't care if it's not copyrighted, it's plagiarism, like stop. There's fucking, okay, what page was that? 144, we mentioned Yeats. 166, there's a moment near the end of Ulysses where the character Molly Bloom appears to speak directly to the author. She says, oh, Jamesy, let me up out of this. You're imprisoned within a self that doesn't feel wholly yours like Molly Bloom. But also to you, that self often feels deeply contaminated. So that's the doctor. That's the psychiatrist. 12 pages ago, it was Davis saying stuff like that. This, if it was all just Davis doing this and being like incredibly like pretentious because he's a rich, smart boy, one thing, no, every character does this at some point or the other. Stop it, stop it, get some help. God damn. And then they start like flirt texting and he's like, I really like your ass. I wanna start a fan blog about your ass. And I'm like, I have no idea what Aza looks like because she hasn't mentioned it once. And there's one thing to like have your character look in the mirror and be like, this is what I look like. But it's another thing to just not tell us at all. Cause I didn't even know she was a girl until someone called her a girl on like page 13. Like, fucking A. They watched Jupiter Ascending, and it was both ridiculous and kind of awesome. I'm so glad. <sighs> page 180. Are you fucking kidding me? So, yeah, every 13 pages. Page 180. There's an Edna St. Vincent Millay poem, Love Her. That's been rumbling around inside me ever since I first read it, and part of it goes, Blown from the dark hill hither to my door, three flakes, then four, arrive, and then many more. You can count the first three flakes and the fourth, then language fails and you have to settle in and try to survive the blizzard. 
she's talking about her spiraling thoughts so like great another another metaphor from somebody else's mouth john green thank you so much page 181 she pulls the hand sanitizer out of her jacket and squeezes it into her mouth and then swallows it she's not just swishing it around she's drinking it which is terrible I told Davis how even though Goodell must have known that starvation was a greater risk than poisoning, he just couldn't eat, so he starved to death at 71. He cohabitated with the demon for 71 years, and then it got him in the end. When I finished the story, he asked, do you worry that will happen to you? And I said, it's weird to know you're crazy and not be able to do anything about it. It's not like you believe yourself to be normal. You know there is a problem, but you can't figure a way through to fixing it because you can't be sure, you know? If you're Goodell, you just can't be sure your food isn't poisoned. Do you worry that will happen to you? He asked again. I worry about a lot of things. We kept on talking for so long that the stars moved above us until eventually he asked, want to swim? And then they get in their underwear and they swim. And then that's the end of that conversation. And, and uh, any headway we were making to Aza um, revealing more about herself than just that she's mentally ill is gone. Gone! Mm. I took his hand and part of me wanted to tell him I loved him, but I wasn't sure if I really did. Our hearts were broken in the same places. That's something like love, but maybe not quite the thing itself. Less words, less words. This book is so short and you said so little and yet you used so many words. You could take three seconds away from your nonstop fucking contemplation of yourself to think about other people's interests. Look, I came up with Ayala in like seventh grade and it was a dick move, but she's her own character now. She's not you, okay? I mean, I love you and it's not your fault, but your anxiety does kind of invite disasters. I'm sorry, okay, I should have let Ayala die years ago. But yeah, you're right. It is kind of a way of coping with, I mean, Holmesy, you're exhausting. Like, I know you have mental problems and whatever, but they do make you dot, dot, dot. You know, I don't know, actually. They make me what? Michael said once that you're like mustard, great in small quantities, but then a lot of you is dot, 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 a lot. Stop talking. Jesus Christ, you haven't shut up in 10 years. I'm sorry it's not fun hanging out with me because I'm stuck in my head so much, but imagine being actually stuck in my head with no way out, with no way to ever take a break from it because that's my life. To use Michael's clever little analogy, imagine eating nothing but mustard, being stuck with mustard all the time. And if you hate me so much, then stop asking me to, Nate, get interrupted because she crashes into a car and then they get crashed into by another car and her dad's phone that she keeps in the trunk is broken and so she has like a fucking freak out she has a lacerated liver and she doesn't want to stay in the hospital because of c diff um yeah page 224 you know siku sundiata in a poem he said the most important part of the body ain't the heart or the lungs or the brain the biggest most important part of the body is the part that hurts mom put her hand on my wrist and fell back asleep so that's the third character that's done this I just, it's just not a thing that people do a lot, John. I don't know. I know you probably only hang out with authors and really smart people. God is angry that I'm talking shit on John Green right now, but people, people don't talk like this. I just want for once, for once, for these fucking people to read their work out loud and realize how pretentious it fucking sounds or how dumb and not like dialogue it sounds. That's all. That's all I want. This is not directed at just John Green. It's every fucking person I've covered on this channel. Since she drinks a bunch of hand sanitizer, they put her on like a lockdown. God. I don't know. I let out a long, slow breath and watch the steam of it disappear in the winter air. I think maybe I'm like the White River, non-navigable. But that's not the point of the story, Holmesy. The point of the story is they built the city anyway, you know? You work with what you have. They had this shit river and they managed to build an okay city around it. Not a great city, maybe, but not bad. You're not the river, you're the city. <sighs> And then Daisy's like, let me tell you another story to give you the title of this book. This guy gives a whole presentation about the history of Earth and life on it. And then at the end, he asks if there are any questions. An old woman in the back raises her hand and says, it's all fine and good, Mr. Scientist. But the truth is the Earth is a flat plane resting on the back of a giant turtle. The scientist says, well, if that's so, what's the giant turtle standing upon? And the woman says, it's standing upon the shell of another giant turtle. But now the scientist is frustrated and he says, well, then what is that turtle standing on? And the old woman says, sir, you don't understand. It's turtles all the way down. I laughed. It's turtles all the way down. It's turtles all the way fucking down, Holmesy. You're trying to find the turtle at the bottom of the pile, but that's not how it works. So Michael and Daisy and Ozzy are driving to Michael's underground art exhibit and they're singing lyrics of the song. She sang lead and I belted out the background voice that just repeated, you're everything, everything, everything. And I felt like I was. You're both the fire and the water that extinguishes it. You're the narrator, the protagonist and the sidekick. You're the storyteller and the story told. You are somebody's something, but you are also your you. 
again, that sounds like the closing sentence of one of his many, many YouTube videos. Um, I was a big fan of John Green's YouTube videos, just like I was a big fan of John Green's novels back in the day. So I would know. She's like, oh, I did love him and I'll miss him a lot. Isn't that terrible? But it turns out not to be terrible because I know the secret that the me lying beneath this guy could not imagine. I know that girl would go on, that she would grow up, have children and love them, that despite loving them, she would get too sick to care for them, be hospitalized, get better, and then get sick again. I know a shrink would say, write it down how you got here. So you would, and in writing it down, you realize love is not a tragedy or a failure, but a gift. You remember your first love because they show you, prove to you that you can love and be loved, but nothing in this world is deserved except for love, that love is how you both become a person and why I just want to know when this turned from a present tense Aza going through it to Aza telling her story as an older person suddenly in the last two pages but underneath those guys your hand no my hand no our hand in his you don't know yet she's now talking to herself from the past you don't know that the spiral painting is in that box on your dining room table with a post-it note stuck to the back of the frame stole this from a lizard for you you can't know yet how that painting will follow you from one apartment to another and then eventually to a house or how decades later you'll be so proud that Daisy continues to be your best friend, that growing into different lives only made you more fiercely loyal to, your to each other. I, a singular proper noun, would go on if always in a conditional tense. But you don't know any of that yet. We squeeze his hand, he squeezes back, you stare up at the same sky together and after a while he says, I have to go, and you say goodbye. And he says, goodbye, Aza. And no one ever says goodbye unless they want to see you again. So I just want to know like what the point was. I've never read a book about nothing. Don't recommend doing it. It's It was a waste of my fucking time. I was just waiting for so long for something to actually happen. And nothing happens. And you can't even say it's because it's a contemporary book. Because first of all, I, I do like some contemporary books. Um, I'll Give You the Sun is one of my one of my favorite books or was one of my favorite books for a long time. Um, I like Jenny Han's books. Like I like contemporary books. It's not just because I only like YA fantasy, paranormal, magical realism, whatever you want to say, nothing happened in this book. The whole plot at first seemed to be that it that we were going to try to find out uh, what happened to Russell Pickett. And then it turned into a love story between Davis and Ozzy while she's trying to battle her mental illness. And then at the end, apparently this whole story was supposed to be about her and Daisy the whole time. Too bad I didn't like either of them. So that is not a fulfilling payoff for me as a reader to read about two people who I don't really like because one is a bitch about her friend's mental illness and one is too mentally ill to have a personality. So anyways, that was my review of Turtles All the Way Down by John Green. Uh, next week or the week after that, we're going to be talking about The Fault in Our Stars, which was the last book I read by John Green before this one. And I remember uh, it breaking my heart and I sobbed into the backseat of my friend Lauren's car on the way home from the beach. Um, let's see if I still feel any feelings about it besides irritation. I'll see you on Tuesday. Bye.